Our first presenter is, uh, is um, Darlene Jewers. And um, as uh, John, her, her topic is creation. I have to put my glasses on to read this. Uh, as uh, John Wesley once wrote, I believe in my heart that faith in Jesus Christ can and will lead us beyond an exclusive concern for the well-being of other human beings to the broader concern for the well-being of the birds in our backyards, the fish in our rivers, and every living creature on the face of the earth. And Martin Luther said, if you really understood a grain of wheat, you would die of wonder. Now, um, Darlene, in the service of research, fell into the Halifax Harbor. <laughs> I let her... <laughs> <laughs> while she was conducting her research. So that's, that's dedication. <laughs> and as you can see, I survived to tell the story. <laughs> Just open with a prayer from scripture. You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Amen. For as long as I can remember, I can find myself sitting on a rock, surrounded by water, meditating on the awe and wonder of creation. We have been given an amazing gift, and all we are asked to do in return is care for it and each other. The issues around fish farming and deforestation have concerned me for many years. As I watch trees slowly disappear and the fishing industry become less and less while fish farming was being promoted, even though it has drastic consequences for the wild fish stocks and the livelihood of the local fishers. While walking on the beach last summer with Mary and Lucas Jeffries, an environmental activist in this diocese, I heard for the first time that an additional promise had been added to the baptismal covenant to maintain the integrity of the, the earth. This immediately sparked my interest. So it is in light of this awareness that my project on creation care evolved. With the passing of Resolution C-001 at General Synod in 2013, these words were added to the baptismal covenant in the Book of Alternative Services as the ninth question of the covenant inquiry. Will you strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation and respect sustain and renew the life of the earth, and the response, I will, with God's help. The ministry and mission of the church unfolds in many and varying contexts. The belief that it is morally wrong to cause damage to the environment has led leaders of faith communities to take on the role of reminding others that it is our duty to restore and maintain the ecological balance of the earth the whole planet. For the last 30 to 40 years, the church has been exploring the understanding that to be faithful as Christians and to live as God's created beings is to be co-stewards with God. In 2010, a process began to incorporate the language with a proposal to General Synod to consider the best way to do this, recognizing the imperative to care for creation. A working group began considering liturgies from other churches and provinces within the Anglican Communion and found that there was significant emphasis on creation care in provincial rites from around the world to put forth a resolution recommending an addition to the baptismal covenant. 
based on the fifth mark of mission, which is part of a framework used to describe and encourage ministry throughout the worldwide Anglican communion. With this at the forefront, I began to explore how the ministry of creation care is experienced and practiced in this diocese. My goal was to discern the level to which participants feel a responsibility to initiate or continue practical and critical measures necessary to secure the well-being of the planet for future generations. I was invited to, to attend the inaugural meeting of the Diocesan Environmental Network. That's where I encountered some many very enthusiastic people representing a huge portion of this diocese. And I heard some amazing stories. Things were happening in this diocese. Everything from community gardens to the installation of windmills to the attempt to eliminate styrofoam cups. Christians derive understanding of their roles and responsibilities for caring for God's creation from the Bible, beginning with the creation stories in the book of Genesis, which offers a profound understanding of the world, God's relation to it, and how we understand our place in the created order. God has given humanity two roles regarding creation, to exercise dominion over and to be stewards of the earth, to ensure that creation can fulfill its purpose of providing for all humanity, now and in the future. Psalms of praise to God for all the wonders of creation, like Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it. Focus on the goodness and creativity of God and not on human selfish needs and desires. When I began the research for this project, I discovered a controversial essay that appeared in Science Magazine in 1967, written by Lynn White. With the exception of Japan, White argued, the industrialized polluting nations were all Christian as a result of humanity's obedience to God's command to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. He said, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion in the world. He argues that humans are confident in their right to possess and use the land as they please, as it is God's will. White's essay prompted many to acknowledge and explore the historical roots of our environmental crisis, evaluating how traditional interpretations of scripture have impacted our environment and the ecological consequences emanating from lifestyles based on these understandings. The promise of hope and restoration involves all of creation. We cannot ignore the crisis we must accept the challenge to make radical changes. Feminist theologian Rosemary Radford Ruther argues, it is only by embodying the vision of eco-justice in its own teaching, worship, and praxis that the church can make itself a base for eco-justice in ministry to the larger community in which it stands. Eco-justice becomes central to the church's mission only when it is understood as central to the church's life. Anything else will lack credibility. Based on my research question, how does the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, teach creation care and inform practices? The qualitative inquiry best suited for my research is a combination of grounded and narrative theories. The use of grounded theory, as all my participants share a common lived experience through a variety of aspects of creation care in their parishes, their region, this diocese, or on a national level. The addition of the narrative method allowed me to hear the personal experiences of each participant through a series of interviews. These experiences constitute the narrative of the study itself. The data was gathered and analyzed for meaning in relation to the initial research question. The questions I asked are directly related to their individual opinions and experiences regarding creation care. 
I interviewed seven lay people, each representing a different parish from across this diocese, six female and one male. These participants all have a long history with the Anglican tradition and agree that the addition is a very important move forward. Let me introduce you to Anna, Tabitha, Lydia, Hannah, Phoebe, Judith, and Wade. The addition to the baptismal covenant speaks to the urgency to which we must respond to the crisis of the earth. There is a need to recover the biblical vision of our relationship to creation and all creatures. When I ask the first question, how do you feel about the addition to the baptismal covenant? Even though there was overwhelming approval from all those I interviewed, I realized that two of my participants had not been aware of the addition until I had given them an introduction to my research. Hannah, a cradle Anglican who was a social worker, replied, I think it makes sense. One of the things that has always been important to my faith is around the notion of stewardship and creation. And I think we sometimes lose that. So the pieces around social justice and stewardship don't always get the play in our lives. And I think it's an interesting thing to put that into words and then help folks figure out how that coat goes on. Tabitha, a longtime Anglican and clergy spouse, exclaimed, I think it's great. I voted for it at General Synod. I think it's about time the church started to recognize that we have a responsibility to protect the earth. And that is not some sort of extra added on thing, but is actually central to our faith. Phoebe, an environmental biologist, said, The baptismal covenant often feels like a really stagnant and unchanging thing. And in a lot of ways, it is. It's cool that it is being changed to reflect new things that are being considered and new ways of seeing God in the world and envisioning who we are in relation to God and in relation to creation. All of that ties together. Very exciting. Lydia, a lifelong Anglican, discussed it with her spiritual group and replied, I was disappointed at the fact that not everyone knew about it. Wade, an active Christian, added, Never has the church before turned around and said, this is part of your requirements as a Christian or as an Anglican. In the baptismal service to, th to think about this, so we think it is a great idea that they put it in. We really do. And I don't think you, you would get any objections from anybody in the congregation. Creation theology affirms God as the creator and source of all things particularly the earth and its resources. Therefore, all things are dependent on God and have a responsibility to God. The addition to the baptismal covenant is a way to help Anglicans connect their faith in terms of the environmental issues and the impact that humans are having on creation by promising to maintain the integrity of creation. It has the possibility to become a mission for the church one of reclaiming the sacredness of all God's creatures. What do you sense is the link between being a Christian and creation care? The verse that keeps getting quoted by people is that God has given us dominion over the earth, and we in the West have taken that to mean that we can rape, pillage, and burn as much as we like. I don't think that is what God had in mind. You know, when God has dominion over things, he uses it to protect them, to cultivate them, to nurture them. God's kind of dominion is not self-seeking, self-satisfying abuse of whatever he's got dominion over. We look at the stories of Christ and his work around social justice. I don't think we tie that back to care for the environment and care for creation as well, because I think they are quite linked. I think we at times tell the story around social justice more from a charity model than from a social justice model. Jesus embodies social justice. I think it goes without question because God created the world and we have to do something to save it. 
I don't feel it should be restricted to Anglicans. We've got church groups all over the place of different denominations. If they all took that little bit of care like we have started and say, yes, let's get on board and let's think about this, over time we might succeed in changing people's thinking a bit. Nurturing, teaching, setting an example for others to follow. God created this whole world and God is in every part of it. So I think taking care of creation should be a logical thing that we just do. And beyond God being everything, the earth is our home and our neighbor's home is our brother's and sister's home. So taking care of creation is taking care of each other. And taking care of each other is what we are called to do and who we are called to be. We are told to look after what is given us. We are told to serve the land, to be fruitful and multiply, to guard what is precious to us, to not store up treasures for ourselves on earth, but yet to look after the earth. So I think there is definitely a link between what we say and what we actually do. It's easy to say we are Christians, but if we don't act that way, we're not. What became clear is that the addition underscores the importance of creation care principles within our gospel message. My participants are engaged in a wide range of activities in their personal lives as well as in their parishes. They are motivated not because environmental issues and going green are the current trend, but because they see themselves as image bearers of the Creator, loving the world as God loves. What is your experience of creation care? On a parish level, I've been involved with a community garden. We started with four eight by four foot above ground boxes, and we got the youth inclusion program involved, which is through the Justice Department. We got another community-based group from a drop-in center for kids that were getting into trouble. We got in touch with them, built a relationship with them, and they became our Advent project. I'm involved with the Wind Power Project in church. The property is about 1,000 acres, and we've kept an eye on it over the years. It is not very accessible. You couldn't raise a cow on it, but it is ideal for a wind farm. I was one of the first people giving out blue bags for samples in the 1980s. When I look around my neighborhood, there's about 70 to 80 percent compliance. I studied environmental biology in university. I attended a free Methodist church, partially because they were on the same page as me in terms of creation care. They have a tiny green space in front of their church that they used as a salsa garden. So they just grew things so they could make salsa and share it together. Being a community is about who you are and where you are and how you think about that stuff. Personally, I am probably not putting my money enough where my mouth is. We do the recycling stuff, we try to use the car less and turn the heat down, all those kinds of things. We are vegetarian, which apparently has the same effect as giving up your car on the environment, in terms of fuel use, for one thing. I'm one of the few people who say, why do we have to use styrofoam cups? <laughs> I want to put up a little sign saying, come on everybody, let's carry our mugs. Respect and care for creation is demonstrated in the ways we live our lives, especially how we utilize our natural resources. The addition has inspired congregations to take responsibility for creation care, directing their energies toward more ecologically sensitive initiatives and behaviors. What do you think we could be doing in response to the addition? Education from the perspective of what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us in our parish? What does that mean for us in our family? How do we live that out? And how do we challenge ourselves? 
For the most part, we need to examine what we can do or doing as a church community. Encourage congregational members to take hold of the idea, educate and inform others in our community. Education. To make people aware of it, you have to educate people by showing them you have to lead by example. We should be doing energy audits in our churches, in our church buildings, our halls and rectories. Most of our churches are having financial issues, but if we could get our churches insulated, we would be spending less on heating. Energies are often directed at human well-being which is definitely important, but at the expense of the earth and other creatures, such as the fish farming and clear cutting. Eco comes from the Greek word oikos, meaning household. The earth is our household of resources, necessary for daily living and survival, and so requires proper management. What do you think is the biggest environmental issue, and what, as Christians, could we do about it? apathy and self-centeredness. We in North America don't give a shit and don't want to have our own happy way of living disrupted. And I'm guilty of that. I'm not setting myself apart from that. And as a matter of fact, as churches, I think we could do something about the problem because we are all about changing people spiritually, helping people to grow spiritually. So it is right up our alley. There's something about climate change that hits people in the core, and you feel it. So if it is not the most important, it feels like the most important, because it is tangible, because you feel like you can make a difference, and it feels like it makes sense as part of Christianity. Greed, because we want things bigger and better. As Christians, this goes back to being aware, education, It is still education. For me, it would be the connection with water and the preservation of water and the use of water and climate change and how the two interact. Here in Canada, the oil sands has to be on top of the list. Then, of course, there is the global warming issue. One main overarching theme that ran through every story was the need for education and training. Does your faith inform your behavior? And if so, how? We don't think about those things except in sermons and even then in pretty oblique ways. So yeah, I think we could be doing a lot more than we are doing. And we could be providing resources for our own people to clean up their own houses and properties. Like we could be saying to them, here's a package. Everyone take one home. It is about water leaking and how to stop it. I agree, but not just in a lecture kind of way, but in a conversational, this is what has been added. What do you think? What does that mean? Something that allows people to explore rather than here are the answers type of thing. Educational pieces in churches, in congregations, from the bishop would be really helpful and making it clear that there is support around this. So let's move forward in a more full, holy, fully who we are as Christians kind of way. Several of the participants suggested ways in which creation care could be incorporated into the liturgy such as the prayers of the people, creation-focused hymns and Earth Day services, holding welcome back Sunday services and inviting the entire community to share in a meal with the harvest from the community garden. One participant related an experience of a service that had happened about 25 years ago that has had a lasting effect. When a young clergy decided one Sunday morning to take the entire congregation on a field trip, They all walked up the road like on a parade. They were asked to pick up things that caught their attention. And when they got back, the Sunday school children led a discussion around the items that they had found in nature. And that was the service. 
There's a great Earth Day Mass. It's a Eucharist, but the prayers and readings are all centered around Earth Day. It is centered around God, but with respect to the Earth. It is not pagan. It is lovely. I really think that this could be a great project where we got to get everybody behind it. We've got to get ministers who think about it. We've got to get the prayers of the people to just mention to thank God for what he has given to us and agree or promise to look after it. I think there are those little bits around Sunday school. A lot of times children can engage and inflame that. Sometimes we are held to account by the children in our parishes. The necessity to preserve water and its connection to baptism was another overarching theme. We are worried about the waterways here. Once a waterway is polluted, it is very difficult to change it. It is very expensive and time consuming. We need clean water for baptism. Water is so connected with our baptism. I think that it just makes sense that it's added. It just makes sense that it's an issue that connects us as Christians. The importance of water and the impact of not having water and clean water and using that resource wisely. People on native preserves in Canada should have access to clean water. As a matter of fact, most people don't. On most reserves in Canada, their water is not drinkable, like 68%. If that was in white communities, we would not put up with it. The church has a prophetic voice, and there are many passionate and skilled people in this diocese who are involved in activism, advocacy, and social justice, with Jesus as their model. Jesus' mission is defined by righteousness and justice. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus fed the 5,000. And Jesus challenged the authorities. This is our mission, grounded in the faith and activities of Jesus himself. As Christians, we need to have a stronger voice in order to voice our concerns, perhaps becoming more involved with our visibility, showing our support of environmental groups, lobbying government to effect change. I think it's the little things, but I also think it's the big pieces around advocacy and putting our vote behind it. So from a political standpoint, but more. So just putting our voice to the concerns and helping to understand and educate around why it's important and try to push that advocacy piece a little bit with Jesus as a mentor in that. Another thing we could be doing is activism. One of the churches we belong to did an earth hour. We got the whole church involved as much as possible. We got the whole community involved. We invited people from other churches. We invited people from the community who didn't go to church. It was a protest against environmental overconsumption. It was a community building thing as well. We can continue to lobby the government in Canada. They said they are not going to go ahead and reach the goals they originally projected. But as far as cutting back on fossil fuels as parishes, as regions, as a diocese, we can get in touch with our MPs, our MLAs, all the different levels of government and really push them. This project provided participants with an opportunity to share and reflect upon their experiences of creation care, especially what has affected each one personally and spiritually. It's an opportunity to encourage all Anglicans to recognize and claim their role as stewards of creation by supporting and sustaining environmental practices in the life of their communities as well serve to awaken the recognition that our ministry is in the whole world. The goal is to infuse creation care into the mission of our churches. It is integral to who we are called to be. A necessary component is communication, to connect the efforts, voices, and experiences of those already involved in creation care with the rest of the diocese. 
The environmental network already exists, initiated by Marion Lucas Jeffries, who has been a consultant on this project. This is a place to connect, a place to hear and be heard. The challenge becomes one of how. How do we as the diocese engage parishes in tangible, meaningful creation care endeavors and projects <coughs> with a desire toward an integrated, interactive, and informed whole? For many Christians, their understanding of creation is limited to the Genesis accounts. We, as church, need a renewed understanding and appreciation for the entire world God made. The Bible is concerned with relationships, our relationship to God, with others, and between humans and the natural world. The notion of creation care encompasses and incorporates all of creation in relation to God. We can incorporate creation care language into our liturgy, assisting parishioners to rediscover the sacred nature of our whole creation, leading to fresh expressions of worshiping God the Creator. As the vision of creation care gains interest and support in this diocese, the challenge will be to make a commitment to face change and participate in the ongoing mission to be co-storts with God for all creation. We are called to be the hands, feet, and heart of Christ to assist in the healing and reconciliation of God's creation here and now. So there will be a future for the next generation. There is no planet B. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Um, was it, was it Mar Margaret Mead that said, uh, it only takes one or two people to change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. So um, thank you for that. I'm going to tell you one quick story before sure. we get to your questions. Um, I went, my, my son sent me to a store called REI. You have that here. It's a, it's a millennial store, I call it. It's a kind of camping store, um, sports equipment, kind of young people, I, I think. He sent me to get some high-tech flip-flops or something. <laughs> he said they're really comfortable. So I go in there, and all the people that work there are young people, mm. probably college students on summer vacation. And so I got my flip-flops and went to check out, and he says, um, would you like a bag for these? <laughs> and I said, no thanks, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just carry them. And he says, thank you, thank you, thank you so much much for not using plastic. I was just like, oh, I feel so yeah. blessed. The only one at flip-flops. You know, but I've done plenty of other things to um, negate that. So um, anyway, uh, we, uh, you, you reminded us of the connection between um, the creation, uh, God's creation, and our baptism and the meaning of baptism. So are there questions for Darlene? So Darlene, we were all lay people. That's right, you were. Um, any reason for us all being lay people? That's a good question. So in the beginning when I, when I first got sparked up about this uh, project, I, I didn't know anything about the addition. I didn't know that was even being considered. And I started talking to several clergy people about it, and they seemed quite surprised as well at, that this had happened. They weren't aware of the process. So, when I went to the meeting of the Environmental Network, the first meeting, there were all these lay people there from all over the diocese, and they were telling their stories, and they were so amazing. I thought, these are the voices that I need to represent. I need those people in my, my project. These are the people who are really 
working and, and doing creation care, I just, I'm just so amazed. And that's why I had to have you people here to just represent those voices for them. Their stories need to be told. Hi. Is there anything in what you've seen or what your people spoke about that is different because it is underlain by the Christian faith? Anything that is different? REI, Mount Cook and Co-op, the Ecology Action Center, uh, ad nauseum have been way out ahead on this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, when I was an undergraduate, I was a founding member of some of those agencies, mm -hmm. way out ahead of the churches. Why should we, A, reinvent anything? Why shouldn't we entirely engage in partnering? <coughs> but more importantly, is it any different when the Christian church considers these issues than when, um, you know, my utterly atheistic board members of Equal Action do? I don't think that, that it was any different for them. That's not the feeling I was getting. My, the revelation was that they have been doing this all along and they just want other people to get on board and make it more so widely they, known. Does the church have anything to add to the environmental discussion? Um, Benedict thinks it does. He's written interestingly on this. Mm -hmm. um, the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox are way out ahead for us to bring nominations in this. And for me, you know, I, so this just doesn't become another thing that we do. You know, we, we work with Coverdale, we go to the food bank, we uh, use plastic, never, you know, all the stuff that we do. But I'm looking for how it's emanating from a faith in a way that, um, you know, may not make the exterior manifestation different from what my atheist friends do with equal action, but somehow it's different for me as an experience. That's kind of what most interesting ones should have. I, I feel that what they are doing is coming from their faith. Most, there's so much more research that I could not bring here, but some of it will be added into my paper. And what they are doing, all the participants were relating it to their faith, what they are doing, the connection, are relating it to their faith. You're, you're asking if it's going to make if the, the addition to the baptismal covenant will make a difference, or how they are responding to that? Well, I, I think I'm interested in a larger question than the baptismal covenant. I'm interested in, uh, uh, in, in, in how uh, environmental concerns, uh, what happens to the environmental movement if you truly try to draw it from the tenets of the faith, rather than say, oh, I like the environmental movement, Let's find a way to match it to what I do at church. I'm saying, what if, what if you let the faith drive the environmental movement rather than the other way around? Does what comes out feel any different mm -hmm. than if you let the environmental movement just kind of find some kind of click? I think that's what, what we're trying to do, and with the environmental network getting up and going and getting people who are involved in the church, it's from their faith that but they're give acting. Me an example. Okay. Um, to me, the faith holds up the community as above the individual. We are, we are not saved. It's never me and Jesus in the corner. Uh, if I have saved, it's a language my friend, I'm sorry, but it's because I'm part of the community, which is together, working to draw us mm -hmm. closer to God. So when I take that into where I put my environmental giving, I don't give to any movement that's out to save the species. I give to a movement that's out to save the land. Because I believe that the land is a closer reflection to the Christian way of viewing God's world mm -hmm. than to save any individual species. I will never own a house cat that I allow out 
mm-hmm. as we become environmental. Like, we all, you know, we were involved in the early days when we recycled glass by picking up little broken bits of balls or their heaters and throwing them in different blocks. So we, we learned that products that we might think are environmental and unfriendly actually are not. So that some kinds of disposable items are better to use than some recyclable items because of the energy cost of recycling. So there's complexity in there. And I, I, I was hoping to hear that, you know, people were uh, trying to find ways to let the faith drive our environmental stuff, just as we let our faith drive our social justice work, rather than pick up on something that the world is already doing and say, oh, well, that fits with Genesis, and maybe Psalm uh, 24 could put with that. And, I'm so sorry, Jesus never said anything about the environment. I thought, really, sucks. I don't know what to do with that. But rather than sort of take it and pull it in, what's it like when we be who we are and we push out? I'll shout now. <laughs> no, thank you. Those are good questions, Deb. That's a question I will continue to work on. Darlene, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. This is an area of passion for me. Um, There's a whole movement out there in ecofeminism that uh, speaks to a lot of your concerns that you've raised this morning. And I think there's a constant need for us to re-articulate our faith in relation to creation. And I don't think that's a said and a a done piece. Once we do that, it's done. Um, Someone like Bruce Sanguin in the United Church of Canada, Greta Vosper, uh, others, you know, have been re-articulating, reformulating that faith. And so I think what you've done is an expression of that and a valid expression of what that is within a very contextual reality. And I was really excited to hear that, that it's related to here, Atlantic Canada, where we are really grounded. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, My question is around uh, kind of, did you see any interconnecting challenges around social barriers and some of the social justice questions and then moving out to do what we need to do in creation care? We didn't talk a lot about the social justice issues, only Mm -hmm. that there are people who are willing to go out and and be on a protest line against anti-fracking and those things, but there wasn't a lot of discussion about that, just people who are willing to to make that. Yeah, but I'm sure that's something you're interested in and something that will kind of come out of your research. This, so much of this was new to me, and I just look forward to, to working further and delving into it deeper. I'm really excited about what I've learned and what I will continue to learn and work on. Thank you. Darlene, thank you. Um, that's that's um, it's a, a really important addition to the baptismal covenant, I think. Uh, one of the things that really interests me is the question of how we go from what we think we know as Christians and as human beings to how we live. So um, evidently, we even find it comforting to have um, kind of creation forward liturgies and so on. And we feel we've, we've done the thing almost, right? <laughs> when we resonate uh, together liturgically. And then, you know, we toot off in our, our cars or we have coffee in those curious yeah. little cups we still manage to use or, you know, eat food out of those disposable plasticky things, right? So, um, and, and then there's the food. Um, so what is it that converts the heart of a Christian, you know, in a way that brings the feet and the hands along. That we are, the feet and right? the hands. And well, so um, in connection with that, so I'd, I'd like to, I'm working around to the question of um, what in your research um, might have pointed to ways in which um, Christian faith empowers what we would call conversion, rightly, mm-hmm. you know, of, of life. Um, and in connection with that, I'd just like to um, uh, mention an essay that um, 
is a really good counterpoise to Lynn White. It's mm -hmm. a classic essay by Wendell Berry called Christianity and the, Surv and the Survival of Creation. Yeah. Uh, his comment on Lynn White, uh, who of course haunts us because oh, we know. have sensitive yeah. <laughs> yeah, consciences yeah. and we let people do that, right? But his comment is, um, you know, uh, the only problem with that essay is he doesn't appear to have actually read Genesis, for mm -hmm. example, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So otherwise, it's extremely cogent, right? Yeah. So um, I recommend that essay to all of us uh, um, as, a, and and it kind of goes to the question of well, what actually would be a, you know, an empowering piece, or a heart changing, practice changing piece. This just this is just a comment in closing, um, uh, and this is perhaps where Christianity and and other faith traditions might. Um, find themselves meeting in the realm of the wisdom tradition, we could say. Um, uh, when I was at the Terra Madre conference, 2010, um, in the opening plenary, we were addressed by people from uh, different um, First Nations groups from different continents. And um, at the closing plenary, Vandana Shiva said, um, you know, what did we hear from these people? And um, she said, well, we heard, uh, we believe that the earth is sacred. Yeah. And we got into big trouble for believing that. Ooh, and yeah. I, I really came home thinking, why aren't we saying that? And is it because we can't imagine getting into trouble? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So the question about conversion of life. Conversion. Be, for these people? These people, I think they've already gone, the people I interviewed, I think they've already gone through a conversion through what they were doing. They were, the, yeah. The communities, the communities, they're very outward focused. And like with the, the wind farm project, they're very um, excited, and I only interviewed one person from that project, the parish that is working on that project, and the, he just couldn't wait to get the income from this wind farm, which isn't even up and running yet, so they can work in the community. So I think that, that, that is, this conversion has already happened, and all, I was getting that from my, the people I interviewed that they were so passionate about what they were doing and, and to get other people involved and excited. Was there any opposition to adding it to the baptismal covenant? And I've what do you say to the naysayers who say, oh, global warming, well, that's just a bunch of... None of the people I interviewed, none of the lay people, only one, the only negative comment I heard was from a clergy person when I was talking with them before who commented it was not worth the paper it was written on. I'm sorry, but we are at time. We want to take a break. So we'll continue this conversation. Uh, there's refreshments in the room across the hall. So uh, bring your questions and comments to Darlene. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>